there was uh, an advertisement that appeared a few years ago uh, in the Santa Ynez, California uh, newspaper, and it uh, described a valley ranch, a literal ranch, not a ranch house, but an estate. And here, here was the ad. Look down on the stars from this unique 9,800 square foot, five bedroom, five bath residence. Whew, man. Best property view in entire valley. 1,075 plus acres, $3.9 million. A little short on that right now. 200 plus acre horse ranch with income and 15 separate structures also available for an additional $2.9 million. Printed right below the ad, this is a true story, was, was this line. $5 off with this ad. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> oh, honey, before I write this $7 million check, we have a coupon. As I said, mom always encouraged me to think through what you're doing. Think things through. There, there are times when we need to reflect when we need to sit, when we need to meditate, when we need to think about what we are really doing. And so today, in light of current events, I want to share some reflections with you about what's going on in our, in our church. Not, not this body, but the corporate church. It was Socrates who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But on the other hand, the examined life can be pretty tough to look at sometimes. And if you're following along with our devotional uh, by Dana Trent, Gifts of the Spiritual Wilderness, she wrote yesterday, uh, she concluded a week in, in which we were to take a spiritual inventory a spiritual self-assessment. And here's what she wrote. Examining our cracked lives for dry and sinful places is probably not on anyone's spiritual wish list. But we cannot arrive at fresh, cool, living water until we walk through the grit of the sand. We cannot accept the gifts of the wilderness unless we are willing to walk through it. There are times when we have to walk through it, go through it together. I don't know how many of you have, uh, this is my favorite children's story. I, every, every preschool class, I read it with them at least once a year. We're going on a bear hunt. Actually, like a lot of children's books, they're written, it's, it's marketed to children, but it's really written for adults. Because here's, here's the refrain. What, when we encounter a challenge, if you're familiar with this book, say it with me. We can't go over it. We can't go We have to go through it. Yeah, I think that's tremendously insightful. Like I, That's not really a children's book. In the United Methodist Church, we, we are going through a challenging time. that we can't, we can't go over it. We can't bypass it. We can't go under it. But we have to go through it. If you're not aware, General Conference of the United Methodist Church was canceled again. Postponed or canceled, that's up for debate. debate but they're not meeting again until 2024. Uh, the good news is that General Conference will not be meeting this year. The bad news is that, is that General Conference will not be meeting this year. I, I guess it all, I've talked to people on both sides. Some people are disappointed, some people are happy, and some people just are worn out. You ever hear that old adage that says, if, if you try to make everybody happy, nobody's happy. And I think that that's, that's kind of where we're at. 
if, if you look at it at the corporate church. And so I just want to be at the outset here totally transparent with you and let you know that, that I, I love being a pastor and I, I love being your pastor. This is Valparaiso First has been a good fit for me. What, what, what I find you desire in a pastor is a good fit for where my gifts and graces are. However, this isn't about you, quite, and I'm just being honest, over the last several years, I have become more and more disenchanted with the United Methodist Church, and more so with our Council of Bishops. But we're not alone in this. Every mainline denomination has struggled with this at one time or another. It's just, it's, it's our time. If, if you, I know some of you have talked to your Lutheran friends or Presbyterian friends or Catholic friends. They've all gone through this at some point. We're not immune to it. Our divisions reflect the divisions in the world right now. Not just, not just politics, but masking and vaxxing and all, all that stuff that goes with it. We've had issues in the past. And I'm, I'm not naive, but my father, who served as a pastor for almost 60 years, he, he, he didn't have to deal with what we have to deal with today. And here's what I'm talking about. The, what is distinctive, what is distinctive about our time right now in doing ministry in the 21st century is the presence and power and influence of social media. Social media, I, you know, I'm not sure where I saw this. If I saw it on Facebook, it just, I saw it somewhere, I heard it, and it just stuck in my mind. Somebody, somebody said, social media has increased our volume and decreased our IQ. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm getting a lot of this, yeah. When we read and reflect on the Gospels, however, we discover that we serve a Jesus who was apolitical. Jesus never debated politics, but he addressed the issues of the heart. Jesus addressed the hearts of the tax collectors, not the tax system itself and not the government. Politics is not the church's issue to solve. Our mission as a church is to address the hearts of people. To stand above the politics and deal with the heart issues of life. I, I know way too many pastors today who over the course of time have, have gotten themselves into hot water because they seem more intent on changing people's minds before they change people's hearts. John Newton did not write the words to amazing grace because he suddenly changed his mind about slavery, but because he first allowed Jesus to change his heart. That had to happen first. A change of heart always precedes a change of mind. In Matthew 18, we find something very interesting. Jesus offended, Jesus offended the Pharisees. He invoked Isaiah 29. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts, he said, their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And so the disciples come to Jesus and, and inform him. They say, you know, you know, those guys are offended over there. And here's what Jesus said. He said, the things that come out of a person's mouth come from their heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Out, it's out of the heart that comes murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. 
I find that Jesus was really good about doing two things. He was really good about defining the real enemy. And he was really good at, at telling the truth. If you read, read through the Gospels and think about it. Go to your room and think about it. The enemy for Jesus was never people. The enemy was never politicians or Pharisees or scribes, but the real enemy for Jesus was division. The real enemy for Jesus was disunity. And the enemy has not changed. Think about this. Division is what Jesus prayed the church would never fall into. In John 17, Jesus prayed this. He prayed, my prayer is that all of them, all, all of us, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is Jesus' prayer for us as well. I've never met anybody who looks forward to dying and going to Washington, D.C. I've never met anybody who says, well, it's my time to go to that great United Methodist Church in the sky. Our task, our task as a church is to draw people to what is essential. And what is essential is, is love and service. What is essential is loving God and loving others. The second thing that Jesus did really well is tell the truth. It's interesting, at least to me, in, in Jesus' time, there was political power to be won by maintaining those divisions. Not just creating those divisions, but maintaining those divisions. There was power to be had in propagating fear. Is it just me or does this sound familiar? I'm getting some, some of this. Think about it. There is still profit in promoting division and fear. Who, think about who you are listening to. Think about who you are following on Facebook. Jesus still invites us to examine our ways. And this, this was Paul's invitation to the church in Corinth. Examine your ways. Test yourself. Here's what he said. Jesus said, reflect on this. Look in a mirror. And first, take the log out of your own eye, he said, so that you can help then take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. But one, one follows another. And the question for reflection, it's not just for today, the question for reflection for us is this. Is there any of that in me that I need to see clearly? Very often, I find what, what we don't like in somebody else is, is what we struggle with ourselves. Despite the pandemic, despite war in the world and violence in our communities, despite divisions in our nation and dysfunction in our denomination, I truly believe, I truly believe this, that this, this can be a time of hope in the church. And in order to do that, we don't, we don't do that by avoiding the tension. We don't do that by avoiding the issues. This is not about the power of positive thinking or avoiding the tough stuff, but by addressing the issues through the filter of Scripture. I know that sounds odd, but let's try it. Andy Stanley writes this. He says, if you're feeling the tension, that means you are exactly where God needs you to be. If you're feeling the tension in our issues, there's a reason for that. The season of Lent, the season that we're in, it's really about losing. 
The season of Lent is about losing because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus said, I'm going to lose so that the world can win. For us to be truly free, for us to be really free of our sins, Jesus had to lose. And of course, we know that that wasn't the end of the story, was it? Yeah, Friday, Friday, Jesus lost. But what happened on Sunday morning? So, so, so what do we do? What do we do with this? Well, I think this is our opportunity to, to extend and provide hope. I'm convinced this is what the world needs today. Your neighbors need hope. We are, we are preparing here for a renewal leave. After Easter services, uh, I'm going to be taking a time to, to step back for a few months. If you're not aware, late last summer, our church was awarded a, a grant through the Eli Lilly Endowment, which allowed us, uh, us as a church, and allowed me as your pastor to, to take some leave time, to step back. And, and there's, a, there's a great group of people. You're going to hear more about this as we get closer to Easter. What you guys get to do, and this was the theme, that the, there's five people that put this together uh, graciously, and they decided that, hey, while the pastor's gone, we're going to throw parties. <laughs> Not that kind of party. But you're, you guys, there's, there's some great stuff coming up that you guys need to pay attention to and, and get involved in. Uh, so pay attention, read your newsletter, pay attention to the announcement. There's some neat things coming up. But for me, this, this is going to be a time of reflection, of rest, of, of renewal. And for us, may it be a time of, of reflection on what it means to be the church, I think the timing of this is in God's hands, really, but it's, the timing is perfect for us as a church to, to think about what is, what is God calling us to be in this, this new post-pandemic world. But in this world, people, people need a church that focus on four things very quickly. First of all, a church that worships God in spirit and in truth. It begins exactly with these times of connecting and singing and praying and listening and learning. The world needs a church that loves extravagantly to allow God to work in our hearts and lives in such a way that we will know, that the world will know, that we are Christians known by our what? Love. See, you guys know this stuff. The world needs a church that witnesses boldly. Our witness should be clear and point to the source of our love and our hope. The source of our love and our hope. Who's that? Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you, Pastor Lowell. <laughs> Pastor Lowell said Jesus Christ. Do I get a second? Yes. Yes. We got a second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Man, you guys are good Methodists. Good for you. Finally, we need a world, the world needs a church that does exactly this, makes disciples of Jesus. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, this past Wednesday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, he addressed the U.S. House and Senate. Karl Rove later referred to Zelensky's speech as an extraordinarily powerful historical moment. And he said that Zelensky and the Ukrainians are defining courage for our time. Now, he used, uh, President Zelensky used an interpreter for most of his speech, but then he changed and he spoke in English for the last part, he told the members of Congress this. He said, peace in your country doesn't depend anymore only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you. It depends on those next to you and those who are strong.
What, what, a, what a perfect visual example, Ruth, of, of the pencils. We, we are better together. This, this isn't, this is a, 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 a renewal leave is not a time to, to step back from the church, but to regather, to be strong. And he's right. Peace should never be taken for granted. Unity should never be taken for granted. And, and what we find here is it, it depends on you. And it depends on the person sitting next to you. So turn to the person sitting next to you and say, peace depends on you. And then look at yourself in the mirror and say, peace depends on me. Now, go to your rooms. And you think about it.